in this week's interview on the Mixtape with Scott podcast, I had the chance to interview an old hero of mine turned recent friend, John Colley at Cornell University. Chalk this one up as part of my Becker student series. John did his PhD at the University of Chicago, where after graduation, he hit the ground running and quickly became relatively famous for a, a, a new field that he was helping create on uh, the economics of obesity, uh, both in terms of its effect on health, but also the labor markets themselves and surrounding policies uh, designed to focus on it. In this candid interview, we discuss his growing up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where he attended the same high school as another interviewee from earlier this season, Joseph Doyle. John talks about the, the journeying through his life, some difficult times of it, and touches on how he chose to be both a scholar and a mentor, but also a provider of public goods to the profession, some of which are probably well known to everybody listening, like the annual guide for grad students that helps them navigate the job market, as well as being one of the architects on the annual job market signaling mechanism that was introduced about a year ago, year about a decade or more ago with other people like Al Roth. It was great to hear about his career and his tenure at Cornell as he's been involved, not just in being a, by reputation, a very collegial man, um, collegial colleague and being um, a highly active researcher, juggling a lot of different things, as well as this movement of his into various kinds of original leadership. He's a very active member of the economics profession. Everyone has probably heard of him or maybe even is fortunate enough to know him. Um, those of you who've had a chance to meet and know him, uh, like I have, consider themselves probably pretty fortunate. It's down to earth, makes it easy, makes it feel like you're talking to someone who is genuinely uh, into talking to you and listening to you at that moment. And he's a real, real blessing to, to everybody in his life. So just as a reminder for those coming late, this is not your typical econ podcast, whatever that might be. It's an oral history of the profession told through selected topics like, quote, Gary Becker's students, among other themes. But it's mainly the personal stories of living economists as they share with us their journeys from being kids, going through high school, going through college, grad school, finding economics and making their way in life. The hope is that by hearing the stories and the mapping out of their life, of real people, it can be really eye-opening and inspiring to other people to know about these different role models, uh, of which there is myriad, uh, and how they navigated their own historical lives, which is itself, there are many, many paths, and maybe paths that you will be embarking on that is the road less traveled for you. Thank you again for supporting the podcast. If you like it, remember to like it, share it, and follow it, and maybe even consider subscribing to it. I'm your host, Scott Cunningham. It is my pleasure to have uh, today as our guest, uh, Dr. John Colley. John, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. Um, so for those that are not familiar with you, uh, could you tell us again your name, your job title, and uh, who pays uh, your salary? <laughs> sure. Uh, my name is John Colley, and I'm in uh, the Brooks School of Public Policy and the Department of Economics at Cornell University. Oh, okay, so that used to be that used to be called Pam, right? So it's called Brooks now. No, you, yes, you merged, right? Is that the deal? What happened? Correct. So the Department of Pam, that was Policy Analysis and Management. People were added to that, and it's now uh, the Brooks School. Uh, so it has more like political scientists, government, oh. a broader, more full service uh, public policy school. Oh, I see. So it didn't fold into the Econ Department. That's what I actually. It's it's so, just a policy school now. Yeah. And so now people have joint appointments. And so whereas oh. previously, like most people had just a single appointment in policy analysis and management, now everybody is in like either sociology and Brooks or econ and Brooks, for example. Oh, OK, great. All right. Very so you've got model. the joint you've got the joint appointment econ. Uh, Correct. Yeah, Which it. I had before Brooks began, actually. But yeah. 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 OK, cool. Um, so here's an icebreaker. Um, What's a childhood vacation that you think of from time to time, even today? Doesn't mean it's your favorite childhood vacation. It might be, but it's one that is kind of burned in your memory for some reason. Oh, cool. Um, so the, it's an easy answer for me. So uh, when I was young, my grandmother lived in Cape May, New Jersey, which is this Victorian town at the very, very southernmost part point of New Jersey. And so our our summer vacation was to go visit her. And um 
it's a wonderful place. And she died in 1978 and we stopped going. That was actually the end of our summer vacations. And ah. so that kind of was our only summer vacation is going to visit her, you know, when I was young. And uh, she and my grandfather buried there. And so um, we took my kids there uh, since they were very, very young. And that's, that's now our family uh, vacation spot. Oh, wow. Wait, so are you going back to, to their house? I mean, did y'all did that house stay in the family? She, no, it wasn't a house. They lived, she had an apartment. Oh, she had an apartment. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, so, so y'all still go there every year or I guess like the kids are getting older. Well, now. COVID disrupted everything, but it was, right. it was our regular summer spot, but I highly recommend it. I mean, it's really family friendly. It's beautiful. Uh, great, great place. Great time. Okay, cool. And so where did you grow up anyway? I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is in Northeast PA. Yeah. Wait. It, Scranton. And it's, that's, so it's, oh, the office. That's the office like, in the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go back there and-, and It's also it, where Joe Biden was born. Joe Biden, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But so it's funny because it, I don't know if you guys saw the UK version of the office that aired first, uh -huh. but from that show, it's apparent that the town it's located in is part of the joke. It's called <laughs> Sloth. And so when I- I went home and somebody told me, you're not going to believe it. They're going to start shooting a show here called The Office. You know, it's going to be set in Scranton. I was like, oh, no, this is actually like a crack. You know, like this is actually making fun of the town. <laughs> but it's definitely in the category of things like where uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. I think people were really honored. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So growing up, I mean, it was a really economically depressed place. So in the mm. 1930s, 1940s, it had like in the census is 140,000 people. And then now it has half that. And oh. so what that means is like you can't sell your house like because everybody's leaving. Oh. And so my parents sold the house we grew up in in the year 2000 for forty thousand dollars for zero. Oh, wow. um, and there's all you know, there's sort of environmental problems. Uh, the whole county is mined out underneath the anthracite coal is underneath. Mm. And uh, so growing up, there was mine subsidence and they had to mm. like try and prop up our house by dumping in like wet sand and rock underneath our house to keep it from wow. falling into the mines. And um, there was actually a, a collapse in our downtown where there was a, a crane, like a construction crane, and the crust of the earth collapsed underneath the crane. And the guy and the crane fell into the, uh, the mines and they never found the body. They just had like last rites and a funeral over the hole. Um, yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a really interesting place, but, but it huh. is also a place where like families are really strong uh -huh. and, you know, there's really tight networks. And so it's, it's really also a wonderful place to go back to. You know, it's kind wow. of the ambivalence of it. Well, did you like growing up there or was it sort of a fun place? Um, so it was wonderful because my mom's extended family was there. And so like every birthday, you're getting together with uncles, aunts, cousins, grandfather, which is just really nice. And yeah. I had wonderful, wonderful teachers for the most part. Mm -hmm. And but, you know, there was high unemployment. There was a real problem with arson. There was the mind subsidence. Um, with arson? So, yeah. So because because the population was fell by half. Yeah. And nobody could sell their house. People would burn their. Oh, my. So there's this really bad outbreak of arson. And, to like um, collect insurance or something like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. And uh, just really strange stuff, too, would happen. There was a serial murderer in our uh, neighborhood. And so oh. he was murdering women and then was sometimes like burn the body. And oh then God. in your they neighborhood. Yeah. And so when it turned out when they caught him that my little sister had slept over at his house. She was oh friends with his gosh. stepdaughter. And so she'd slept in the house of a serial killer. Oh my gosh. And then after they caught him, like the neighbors bought the house and tore it down, made it into a park because they just didn't want the house there anymore. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. that's wow, that's a that's a that's a different kind of childhood. Yeah, I apologize. Was... We went dark there very quickly. <laughs> no, wasn't my intention. Great. But... That's great. Well, what did your what did your mom and dad do for a living? What 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 took them to Scranton and kept them there? Yeah, so my my mom was born there, and my dad's family was from the area, but then they left, and he came back. Oh. Um, and so my mom was a homemaker, and my yeah. dad started out, he was, um, at different points, he was like a carpenter. He went to carpentry school and was a carpenter, and then in the 70s, economic collapse, like nobody's building houses, right. so that was that. And so he was a truck dispatcher, um, and then he got a white-collar job with the city, and um, mm. yeah. And, oh, and also, I, I forgot, he worked for the Pennsylvania Gas and Water Company for a public utility. It's like, is it is it that that strong family, extended family kind of anchored your whole family there a little bit? Is I think so. Yeah. yeah. I still have aunts and uncles there and um, uh, okay, cousins, a lot of extended okay. cousins. So 
So if I was to talk to your grade school teachers and I was to ask them, you know, like maybe it's like middle school, what's John Colley like? What's he like in class? What does he like? What does he dislike about school? If you had to imagine just like some of these, some of these teachers you remember real well, what, what do you think they saw? What kind of kid did they see? Yeah, I, I mean, probably nothing too exceptional. I think uh, like there were some teachers I really liked and that I felt like I had a special relationship with. And there was, um, you know, there's some people who were kind of bad apples. They weren't they weren't good or didn't care. But um, but like I said, I had really, really good teachers on the whole. Yeah. And in particular, like history mm. uh, just had one in English. I feel like every teacher I had for history and English was fantastic and just mm. really inspired me and made me really excited about the material. On the other hand, I don't think I ever had a good teacher at any level in math ever. Mm. And so I think that had an effect too of like, it's just not as exciting to me as, as other subjects sometimes. Um, were you pretty good at math though? Did you feel like you were deep down good at math? <laughs> so this is like a funny question, right? So like, I was always like in the, uh, like honors math or AP math, but um, like a foreign economist, am I good at math? Like, no, right? Like I'm not like an applied mathematician. Right, um, right. Yeah. Right, I see, okay. So, so, uh, well, so what did you wanna be when you grew up? when you were when you were a kid i mean so different things so when i was really little i remember i wanted to be a baker because i really liked you know having cookies and stuff and i thought like wow if i'm a baker i can just make whatever i want and eat it whenever i want yeah, yeah. um and then i wanted to be like in the marines i wanted to be you know a politician be the president mm. but then like during high school um i really decided I wanted to be an economist, which is kind of funny because there's no, I wanted to be an economics professor, wow. even though my, my, my high school had no economics, right? How did that happen? So I did policy debate in high school. Oh. And so you'd inevitably sort of end up discussing economic issues. And then yeah. I start, I read uh, like Hal Broner's Worldly Philosophers, oh, which I think yeah. is like a really accessible person-based uh, introduction to economics. Yeah. And then even like um, Milton Friedman's Free to Choose, which mm -hmm. is like, Kind of like poetry. I mean, it's this incredibly elegant, brief, mm -hmm. uh, sim be beautiful in its simplicity view of how mm -hmm. markets work. Mm -hmm. And it's just really inspirational. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think all of that made me think, I want to be an economics professor, even though I didn't know what that was. I didn't mm -hmm. even know really what the subject was, for sure. But um, I just happened to guess right. Uh, and so right. I feel bad. Like there's sometimes students who come to my office and they ask like, well, when did you figure out what you wanted to do? And I feel You're like, right. oh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. This is 12. gonna be a bad answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was in high school, yeah, but I really—it right. was just a lucky guess. I didn't yeah. know, so don't feel bad. But <laughs> that's right. Yeah, the sooner you can start investing in that economics, human capital, the better. Uh, well, so uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So were you just reading a lot of those econ books, like uh, in high school? Like you were just kind of starting to just uh, like just you were you just once you decided you want to be an economics professor you just began to kind of invest in, I have cats just like all, yeah, no worries. <laughs> nobody can hear it on yeah, the podcast. But I, but I, I mean, a few, uh, I wouldn't even have known, right. What the, right, what the right books are to read. But yeah. like at that time, like you would read, this is going to sound completely anachronistic, but you'd read the newspaper, you'd read time right. magazine, you'd read, mm -hmm. you know, us news. And, uh, I, I wouldn't have had access to the economist back then, but, um, you know, but that's so what you were doing because you were because you were really interested. It, it, you were also kind of interested in public policy because you were oh, saying sure. it was in the, the policy debates. Right. Yeah. Right. And I should clarify for people who don't know, like the high school debate world, there's different kinds of debate categories. And so some of them, you basically don't have to prepare anything. You can kind of just show up and then, you know, discuss based, you know, or argue based on, you know, some premise you're given when you arrive. But but policy debate, there's a single broad topic for the whole year. And mm -hmm. so you spend a lot of time researching your the case you want to make and also like arguments. And so there's a lot of actually like library research and citing of references and like thinking in depth about the pros and cons of different policies for sure. Mm. What were some of the things about that experience doing policy that like for somebody that's never done it, that, that you would just say is like a really beautiful experience that might happen in a year? So, I mean, one of the most beautiful parts is that um, it's a team sport. And so you have a partner and you just really bond with your partner because you're going through all these different tournaments for the whole year together and you're preparing together. Um, and so also like, like on a basketball court, like you, where you 
there's sort of the beauty in like passing and team defense. The same thing is true in a debate where, you know, each of you is handling different parts of this. You're working together to, uh, you know, to jointly, you know, pull off the win. Mm. Um, and like a sports, like sports, it's just really fun to compete mm -hmm. and to, 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 and actually to practice and get better and then mm. to earn it. Right. Mm. Um, so policy debate has sort of all these rules and all these conventions. And so you can't just be a smart person who walks in off the street and, right. and it's going to dominate. It's not going to happen. You really right. have to like learn the rules, practice, compete. And so it really feels good. Like when you've earned it uh, mm -hmm. to, to get the victories. Yeah. Did, so you had a good uh, debate teacher, I guess. Is it that, that he's really, the debate coach is really important. I'm sure you didn't have a great one. That's true. That's true. So this is okay. So this is getting to a, a very strange uh, issue. So yes. So he was, uh, a good debate coach in the sense that uh, he sort of trained us and gave us these skills. Um, he was a bad debate coach in the sense that he was a pedophile and he molested ah. me. He molested other people as well. Oh, and so gosh, again, I'm I don't so mean sorry. to go dark, but that, that is the reality. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, yikes. Well, um, that's, that's tragic. Uh, um, and so I should say like, I, um, I didn't know how to handle it at the time. Yeah. And so, um, so I just kind of uh, dealt with it at the time. And then uh, when I went away to college and had some separation, I got some perspective on it. And I went back and I got him fired from his job. And I, I went to the police and mm. they didn't do anything. Uh, I found out he was teaching somewhere else. I got him fired from there. Um, mm. But he, he never went to jail or anything. <laughs> oh my gosh, John. That's just, yeah. Um, Wow. Well, so, so a lot of people would have been derailed, you know, by such a traumatic event. Um, you, you were, you were uh, able to go to college though. Oh yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, but I'm sure, it, yeah, I guess everybody responds to these things really different. Um, well, so when you go to college, what what were you end up going to harvard that must have what was that like for you to get in uh surprising uh yeah. you know uh, exhilarating it was it was awesome um and it's funny because i can remember in high school i had these preconceived notions i thought like oh god harvard right like there's gonna be all these snobby rich people i don't want to go there you know yeah. and i'd gotten in i'd gotten into princeton early and i thought like okay maybe you know i'll just do that and my mom mm -hmm. said like well look before you say no just go up just go up on a like the visiting students day and it was that kind of arrangement where like the incumbent students the, the students who are already there let you stay with them and mm. i just got these super cool relaxed guys who let me stay with them and it was really fun and it was it was not pretentious uh people were not snobby and i just thought like this is great this is uh you know i love the atmosphere i, I don't know about you but like i'm just inspired to be around people who are you know, like smart hardworking, ambitious yeah. like there's just really in a positive way, like inspiring. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that, that attracted me to go there. Hmm. So immediately you take that econ, what do they call it? Eek one or uh, one? Ek 10. Ek 10. Right. That's what it was that, then at least. So it was Marty Feldstein. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But Marty yeah. Feldstein was sort of like your master of ceremonies. Like he would, um, there was, two, my memory is two meetings a week for like 50 minutes. And then there's a 50 minute section with a graduate TA. Yeah. Um, and in, one kind of interesting irony is a lot of the grad TAs were not econ PhD students. They were in like business or other things, <laughs> but they were really good. So like the one I've lucked into getting was Nancy Kane, who, who's now a, like a full professor at Harvard Business School. Right. So uh, that was my that was my grad TA for, uh, wow. for micro. So she was awesome. She was so much fun. She would curse. She would come in like wearing these really cool clothes <laughs> and super dynamic. Um, and so Marty would do some of those. Uh, 50 minute lectures, but he also brought in a ton of guest speakers. Huh. And I remember for one, this guy was ancient. Like he, he must've been, Martin Feldstein must've invited him kind of like to show respect to him. Uh. And so this ancient guy is giving this talk and some kid in the first row jumps up and yells out, uh, but professor, professor, what about the, what about the threat of inflation? Which had nothing to do with what the guy was talking about. And so the poor old man is just flustered and he's like, well, we'll sit down son and I'll, I'll get to that, which he wasn't going to. And so then the guy like pulls some cord and this giant life vest inflates on him and he screams about inflation and then runs out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know if somebody dared him to do it or it was some like Did some. Did Feldstein know that was coming? No, he wasn't there. <laughs> oh my God. But he I always think that, 
that poor old guy and then oh the old guy just goes God. back to trying to like maintain order and like, have his guest lecture oh my gosh that is hilarious yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> wait what year was that that was that would have been like, uh early 90s 90 89 to 90 89 90 oh my gosh yeah yeah uh, yeah, I realize like inflation's a little fresh in their mind, right? It's like only <laughs> 10 years. That's hilarious. Um, uh, so did that, what, so what, what professors made an impression on you while you were there? Yeah. And I'm sure well, I mean, it's an exciting time. Oh, for sure. For sure. And so like, I would have to say, um, Claudia Golden would mm. be like number one. Um, so she, when I was like an upperclassman, um, let me take her PhD class in uh, economic history mm. and just throughout was just incredibly kind and supportive and encouraging. Mm. And she wrote a recommendation letter for me for graduate school. Mm. She like picked the phone and um, called a colleague to ask them to give me data so mm. I could use it for a research paper. Mm. Um, I mean, just truly a wonderful, wonderful person. Mm. Um, and then, I mean, I just lucked into having like David Cutler for... Um, Applied Micro, Larry Katz, um, Greg Mankiw for Macro. Yeah. Uh, Guido Imbens taught us our intro econometrics, right? Oh like that's God. like overqualified. So <laughs> uh, and, uh, oh, wow. And that's right. You were there. You were there when those guys were there. So that would have been, so he was teaching, he was teaching undergrad econometrics. Yeah. Like intro was, econometrics. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So and, cool. uh, and then one time saw a poster that, um, I can't remember how, funny, but maybe maybe like the departmental secretary said, "Hey, you know, John Kenneth Galbraith comes once a year to meet with undergrads. So you want to sign up for this?" And the, like I'd read some of his books, like in high school even. And so I said, "Absolutely, like sign me up." So got to go and be in the room with like John Kenneth Galbraith and like a handful of other people, and it's like touching history, right? Like here's this guy who's born in like the wheat fields of Canada, mm -hmm. and then comes down and runs like a little bit of overstatement here, but like runs the entire U.S. economy during World War II, right? Like sets all the prices. Um, mm. And then becomes this public intellectual afterwards, where people would like watch TV to hear John Kenneth Galbraith be interviewed about, you know, the social safety net or something. What, yeah, you just had so, like lunch with him or something. Yeah, yeah. Oh my just gosh. shoot the breeze. Yeah, he's like a hundred feet tall, right? He was very tall and skinny, <laughs> which emphasized it even more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. So, so you were doing research as an undergrad at Harvard. You were getting this data. So that's interesting. So, like, I mean. Is that pretty, was that pretty common as the undergrads to be doing research or was that like kind of you? No. So that was for, that was for Claudia Golden's class. And so oh, because it was okay. a PhD level uh, economic history class. Oh, right. She yeah. helped get, get me the, uh, the data, but I was a research assistant in uh -huh. um, this housing center over in the Kennedy school. Oh. Uh, so I was, at, I was an RA uh, during undergrad, but I started out, my job starting out was, uh, was called dorm crew. And so this was the highest paying job. So I was work study, right? I needed money. And um, so this was the highest paying job. So dorm crew meant cleaning other people's bathrooms. Yeah. And so, you know, like you'd get, you'd put in 10 hours a week going to upperclassmen's uh, rooms and, and scrubbing their toilets and tubs mm. and sinks. Uh, and so it's funny, my wife like mentioned this once to somebody and they said, uh, that sounds like what Harvard would make somebody from Scranton do. <laughs> you know? mm. <laughs> but I'll tell you, um, like a lot of other people did this and it was like a way to make money. And in mornings, like seven to 9 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday, I go out and empty garbage cans yeah. to like pick up extra hours. Yeah. Because uh, textbooks are expensive when you're uh, earning it at the hourly wage. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 Wow. So where did you want to go to grad school? I mean, you end up going to Chicago, but like, what did you, you know, Chicago, I mean, you, you mentioned you'd read Friedman in, in high school. So like, right. You always, I mean, I, I, <laughs> and like in love with Chicago. So I mean, like, you know, it, I, I would have, that's what I would have wanted to do. But is that what you were kind of no, like felt I, gravity towards? No, I just, I just wouldn't, have, I didn't know. I just knew like there's a whole bunch of good ones. And so apply to the good ones as right. well as some others and then just see what shakes out. So yeah. here's the mistake I made. I don't know about like how you think back to like yourself entering college, but like, I did not know the hidden curriculum. I did right. not know how to navigate the system. Yeah. And so what I knew from high school is like in high school, um, if you're like one of the smarter students, you just take all the hardest classes. Yeah. Right? You take like honors, everything or AP, everything that you can. Yeah. And so in college, I thought that's what you do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I signed up for like the hardest computer science, the hardest calculus. 
and would go and they'd say like, this is a class just for majors. Like if you're not majoring in math, you should not be here. Mm. And I would think you're not going to scare me off, man. Like, you know, I know, so I didn't know I was naive. And I took these classes that were absolutely not wanting me there. And I didn't do great at them for sure. Right. Like, it's an understatement. Right. And so then like, if you, you know, not having these great grades in like computer science and math, when you apply yeah. to PhD programs, you know, yeah, they don't, getting, they can't, they're, they're not like discerning the, right grit the grit that was you were using right they're just like looking at a letter right yeah yeah yeah. and so i got into chicago because at that time chicago had a very different policy than most other top econ phd programs which was like their their philosophy was like we can't pick the winners in advance Mm -hmm. let's let in a broader set and then we'll fail out like half the people like half the people will either get failed at or will leave voluntarily because they don't like the the rigor mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so that was great for me you know like i got yeah. in and well, so uh, probably like claudia's claudia wrote you a letter or something like correct. that correct yeah yep. yeah and i'm sure she her letter would could like explain those grades a little bit but they still had to kind of you still felt like they were taking a chance on you or sure. they were you were in that you were in that margin zone. that zone or whatever yep uh, i see yep. so what was first year like i mean you go there what was what was first year like so, well, I guess I can answer that two different ways, right? So the, the academic side is that, um, and again, like I didn't know what I was in for. I didn't understand. I was not sophisticated or savvy going in. Um, mm-hmm. So I knew that there was this core exam that was high stakes at the end of the year and that like historically, like half the people don't pass it. Yeah. And the way that it worked is you took micro, macro and econometrics and you had to get PhD pass on all three. Mm. Uh, so it was either fail, master pass or PhD pass. And um, if you got PhD pass on two, then you only had to retake one. And the only retake was a year later. There was no mm. other retake like a month later. So you basically would retake the classes to be sure you, ha- you were sharp on them. Right, right. But if you only got PhD pass in one, then it was considered that you failed all three. Oh, crap. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So high stakes, go into it. And then on the personal side, I ha- that was personally the worst year of my life. Mm. And so I went with a, with a fiance. It went sour really quickly. We're cohabiting. We break up. You know, I have to like <laughs> extricate myself from that. That takes time. And then I got pneumonia. And because of like the time pressure of like all the classes and the stress, I didn't get it diagnosed for months. Oh, and gosh. so I was just exhausted and sick all the time. And so I would go to class and then go to the library so I could sleep until the next class. And oh, so gosh. I just could not study, could not function as well. Um, and then the other thing is, um, like, I just didn't have the same level of math preparation as other people. Yeah. Um, and it was only like years later that somebody told me like, oh, but you realize like a lot of the people in our class had done a master's somewhere else. Like they'd had all those classes before <laughs> and we're taking them again. And I had no idea, right? Yeah, like, no, because so, I didn't do I the hidden curriculum. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, yes. so are you telling me you didn't pass your prelims? I got two PhD pass, so micro and macro, and oh. I got master pass on econometrics and I had to retake econometrics. And but you here's, were deathly ill the whole year. So in fact, you're a genius. Yeah. That's what it, that's what uh, you're no, no, a, no. You, you, you've come to the wrong conclusion. <laughs> that means you must be amazing. Uh, that's incredible. Wow. But, it was, but here's the silver lining to that is then, so I thought like, well, I'm not going to take any chances. You know, yeah. I only get the one retake because if you don't pass the second retake, you're the, the one retake, you're out. Yeah. So I'm just going to retake all the econometrics classes. And so that means I sat in, you know, for a second time on Jim Heckman's econometrics course, which was really helpful to me. Mm. And so here's like potentially one of these like branches that kind of changes your life is mm-hmm. he he introduced this n- innovation in his class that year. The bell curve by Hernstein and Murray had just come out mm. and he said, OK, here's a class project is you can form groups. And I want you to replicate using the NLSY 79, the work of Hernstein and Murray and critically critique it. And you can have groups of, I'm going to guess like up to four, right? Um, and I thought, perfect. Like I'm not, I'm not, I don't excel at like, you know, theorem proof econometrics or like, right. you know, homework, but like doing actual research, I feel is more. Yeah, this almost sounds like zone. high school policy where you were in your groups again. Yeah. So, but in this case, remember, like I'm retaking, most of the people are taking for the first time. Oh, so I didn't have a natural retake. group. It's my retake. Yeah. So yeah. I just said, you know what? I'm going to do it alone. Oh, you did alone. I okay. did alone. So I did my thing alone. And the, the teaser was that if you got, if you were one of the top two teams, mm-hmm. then you got an A in the class. Right. Mm. And 
And on the retake, they take into account your grades. And so I was like, I need that A, right? And so I ended up being one of the two groups, the top two groups that got the A, right? Yeah, group of one. Group of one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so that was how I got to know Jim Heckman, really. And yeah. then I got to work with him and collaborate with him. Wait, what were you reproducing? And that changed you my life. Do you remember what you were reproducing of the yeah, book? Yeah, yeah. So this I've is not book. read the book. I just kind of know it by reputation. Yeah, so it was this very controversial book. So it's Hernstein and Murray, The Bell Curve. And the premise, their premise is basically that the reason we see inequalities among racial and ethnic groups has to do with like the heritability of things like intelligence. Yeah, yeah. It's an IQ book, right? right. Distribution of IQ by race. Right. And so they do this, some empirical work where like they regress wages on education and on AFQT, which is a measure AFQT, in the NLSY. They using the, like, they're mainly using the NLSY? Yes. Uh, and they interpret the AFQT as IQ, Yeah. whereas AFQT is like a military test to assess like ability, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very different than an IQ test. And even mm -hmm. IQ tests aren't necessarily like tests of innate ability and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really fun. And then this really changed my life. So by working with Jim Heckman, he took me to- Wait, so uh, yeah. are you supposed to just be replicating? Or no, so it criticizing? was criticizing. Oh, so what was wrong with, so what kind of conclusion did you come to about their work? I'm just curious. Yeah, so I mean, obviously they drew, I think it's fair to say like too, I mean, certainly too strong a conclusion about- um, The role of the AFQT and wages or something? Yeah, exactly. Like, in, you know, in fact, like AFQT explains a very small percentage of variance in, mm. um, uh, you know, weight in wages, for example, or employment. And um, I definitely do not remember like the details. So this would have been like 94. Mm. So uh, yeah, almost 30 years now. So my memory mm. of like what my paper exactly was is a little vague. Sure. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Oh, that's really cool. Huh. So Heckman, what did he say to you? He really liked it. Well, I wouldn't say that. I think like, uh, you know, he was, he was like, uh, you know, I think he noticed me. Right. And so yeah. got to talk to him and said, I'd love to work with you. And uh, yeah, so did get to work with him. We co-authored a couple papers that relate to the bell curve. Uh -huh. And oh. but most importantly for my life is he took me to a conference on poverty at the Kennedy school. And that's where I met my wife. Oh, and so because Heckman took grad student co worked with grad students and took them to conferences, like I've got a wonderful spouse now. So oh. I'll always be grateful to him for that. Wow. So you and him, what was y'all's relationship like as as student to professor? So it's great. I mean, so I one thing I really appreciate is like I am not the typical um, Jim Heckman student, right? Like I think of like Jeff Smith. Yeah. Petra Todd, Petra Ed Vitlisil, like these guys are econometricians, they're methodologists, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not, right, like I'm applied, right. and I just really appreciate the fact that, you know, he still was, weren't, you know, happy to work with me, and right. invest right. in me, and it was really good uh, experience and training, right, so mm -hmm. you can like sort of read books about economics, you can take classes, but the way you really learn how to do research is by collaborating on it, and how does, how does Jim Heckman invest in John Colley's human capital? Well, can you like give me some examples? Sure. Examples? So, <clears throat> so we'd be working on a project and he would, you know, I'd have a meeting with him and he'd say, okay, here's the next steps. You know, here are the things I want to see. And, and it's not just like top down, but it's sort of like talking about like, what are the assumptions we're making? What is it we really want to test? How can we convincingly test it? Like, what is the right data? What's the right model? And then, <laughs> and then him saying like, okay, how, can, how soon can you do that? <laughs> and, kind of, and kind of the right answer is by the end of the day. Right. And so, right. Um, you know, so he'd be in the social science building at UFC. I'd be across the midway. Like I'd have an office across the midway in uh, what was then called like Nork. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and so we'd go back and forth to meet with him. But then the funny thing is, is like you'd work, you know, sometimes till late at night and then leave the, the printouts of the results for him at the desk, at the guard's desk. Mm -hmm. And then before he went home, like he'd swing by at like 10, 10, 30 PM and pick up the results and then would email you feedback within hours. Mm. And so it was really rapid feedback mm. um, and very continuous. And sometimes like if he, you know, he's getting ready for a conference and it's going to be like all hands on deck, we're working on this like all the time for mm. the foreseeable future uh, to mm. make progress here. Uh, and then, mm. you know, like writing together, right? Like, so just iterating on drafts and, you know, talking about how do you, you respond to a referee request? How do you, mm. how do you make a good revision? Um, mm. How do you define 
like what's the right um you know the right way to to write a literature review and the importance of citing like major work that's decades old right yeah. like like realizing how important the yeah. foundational papers yeah. are yeah he's uh, a real professor i mean it seems like there's people that are writing papers and then there's people that are really great in the classroom and, and then there's like people that also do this all this soft skill uh invest you know mentoring it seems like he's all three of them or well, at least yeah. it sounds like he was you know doing like the you know in the weeds with a student oh absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. and he yeah. advised a lot of people like there's mm. um a lot of people who are on the trajectory they are because mm. he invested in them yeah. so you also end up working with becker is heckman your advisor yeah. or is becker your advisor becker was the chair of my committee and yeah. uh heckman was on the committee as well as tom phillipson and david Meltzer. oh okay okay so so did you go there like like how does how is it at chicago that you would go about the selection process of matching with that advisor what is that is it just like random kind of or i mean it's like it's like you just say you have an idea or you tell me you definitely weren't you definitely weren't assigned to anybody yeah uh, is i have no memory of like being told like hey if you have questions the first year check in with this you know randomly assigned professor i don't remember that yeah but the one great thing is that like the core courses were taught by fantastic people, right? Like, yeah. so in micro, you have Becker, you have Rosen, um, mm. you know, you have Lars Peter Hansen in econometrics and, you know, uh, yes, yeah, Tom Sargent. Becker, yeah, that famous Becker uh, price theory class. That was your first year. Yeah, that yeah. was great. And yeah. so that's how you can get to know these top people. So Becker is just wonderful. So I mustered up my courage first year and like went to his secretary and asked to meet with him for office mm -hmm. hours. And met with him and just said, I just want to say hi, like I'm a first year. And he just really kindly asked about like the research, like I talked about the research that I'd done on such a you know preliminary level in college. And he was just like really nice. And he listened mm. and he said, well, it sounds like you're going to do really well here. Mm. And I thought like that has to be like the only compliment I got like my entire first year at Chicago. Right. Wow. And so that's just kind of who Becker was. He was just mm. such a nice person and very encouraging. And like, here's this guy with an incredible opportunity cost of his time, incredible mm. brilliance. And he's willing and seems ha seemingly happy to like meet with even like a first year student and to be nice and encouraging to them. Mm. Mm. So what did you, so what do you end up writing your, what's your, what's your dissertation and what's your job market paper? So um, I got really interested in Becker and Murphy's theory of rational addiction. Oh, and so I guess I should clarify, like when I get excited about economics, there's all, people get excited about different parts of it, right? Sometimes yeah. it's about the pl applied math aspect or like the causal inference part, like, you know, like your, yeah. your work, for example. Um, and then other times it's about like the social science of it, which I know yeah. you're excited about too. Like, mm -hmm. why do people do what they do? Like we right. can use economics to better understand that. Mm -hmm. And I've always been just really interested in the extremes of, of human behavior. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm interested in the economics of risky health behaviors. Yeah. And that includes things like, um, like obesity, like yeah. how, how do people make decisions that end up where some people are, have extreme obesity, for example. Mm. And likewise, why do some people engage in self-harm and suicide? Or, mm. you know, how, how do we explain drug addiction um, or risky sex? As I know, you know, like the topics you've worked on, for example. Yeah. Um, and so that's one thing I really liked about the theory of rational addiction is like using the tools of economics to study things in a very Becker way of like that previously were not thought to have anything to do with economics mm. and to understand like, how is it possible that people could end up being, you know, in this terrible, you know, sort of equilibrium of, or, or steady state of being alcoholic or a drug, being drug addicted. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I was thinking of like, okay, but empirically, what could I apply this to? Other people have applied it to smoking. Um, there's even been like one paper on applying it to gambling, alcohol, a little Remind bit me on again when the rational addiction paper is. That's the late 80s, right? 88, uh, 89? It's 88. I think it's yeah. 88. Okay. So it's you're 88. there like mid to late 90s. So it's like kind yep. of a fan. It's a famous paper at this point. Like, oh, for sure. Yep. Okay. So it's got like already a growing literature and then a growing empirical literature. Yeah. But I think like the data was the problem. The data um, was like the problem. there's just such poor data on like people's use of narcotics, yeah. for example. And so right. tobacco was really where people had used it. And even then, a lot of the time it was aggregate data, aggregate like state data. year data, yeah, uh, which led to sort of methodological problems. Other people have pointed out, which spurious mm. correlations over time that look mm. like addiction, but aren't 
necessarily. Oh, I see. Um, but you were so really fascinated. You were, was it the rational addiction element or was it this idea of like, I might use economics to study anything or is it just kind of both of those? It was, it was how oh, it's all together. Yeah. yeah. It was all together. Yeah. That's how I was too. Or I am. Yeah. 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 And uh, so at but first you lock on to obesity, you lock on to obesity. Not right away. Not oh, right away. Okay. So and she's an addiction. I'm thinking like, well, what can I apply this to? And I actually, so being a child, you know, being somebody who grew up in the eighties, I thought uh, anorexia, right? So oh. could people, some, could people become addicted to self-denial? So oh. for people who didn't grow up in that era, like in the eighties, there was a huge, like um, middle-class fear of anorexia. Yeah. And I remember sort of that. Thing. I totally forgot. I haven't thought about that in years. Yeah. yeah. And so one example is Karen Carpenter. So the singer right. for the Carpenters, she was a brilliant drummer and singer, and she died from anorexia, just like would mm. not stop starving herself. Mm -hmm. And there were like, you know, the sort of material of after school specials yeah. is like, you know, the perfect middle class little girl is going to, you know, could could fall prey to yeah. this and end up dying from anorexia. So yeah. I thought, well, that's what I want to look at. Could you become addicted to self-denial? Oh, But then when I went to look at the prevalence data, like there's very, very few Anorexia. What is it? What is rational addiction to self-denial look like if there's no prices? So like you're looking, what are you looking at? So this is price just like me as like an early grad student, like yeah, kicking sure. around, yeah. you know, possible ideas. Uh -huh. um, but so, and so when I, for, when I saw like how few anorexics there really were, uh -huh. I also saw at the other end of the spectrum, like, wait a second, there's way more people with obesity than I thought. Mm. And so just to put this in context, so this is like 1995 and there's not an appreciation yet of the rise in obesity because the data we had were based on these periodic national health and nutrition examination surveys. Mm. And there'd been a rise from like 80 to 88, but like the more recent data weren't out yet showing oh, that. So they were increase. so spaced out in time. Right. Oh. So nowadays they run continuously. Yeah, it's yeah, called yeah. the Enhanced Continuous. Wasn't always that way. Mm. And so there weren't people like focused on obesity that were like, the only economists really focused on obesity were like Fogel and, and Costa, who oh. used it as a measure. And they, it wasn't obesity, it was BMI as a measure of like caloric intake and well -being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Um, right. Because that's like, <clears throat> yeah, because it, that, that's even like complicated, right? They were like, they're, they're interested in things like height and, you know, income as a way of like showing up in like, Old yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. And so that's going. how I got interested in obesity is just realizing like, wait, this is the bigger group that's not okay. really being talked about. Yeah. And so let's better understand that. So my dissertation was about applying the rational addiction model to obesity. So you had the and theoretical so, model. It was a, th you yeah, had yeah. Of, oh, okay. Okay. And the kind of, the kind of neat, uh, so, and, and altering the rational addiction model to make it a focus more on the stock of weight than the flow of dietary, like caloric consumption. Yeah. Um, and then another part was about trying to trying to explain to economists why they should care about obesity. And so yeah. estimating the effect of obesity on wages. Ah, um, right. And so wait, so, what day, remind me the data set that you end up using for that paper. Is that's, that that's, that's your also, job market paper? Is that your job market paper? That famous, yeah. the famous one? Okay. That, that's uh, fame. You're, you're too kind to call it famous, <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was that paper. Uh, yeah. So that's in JHR, right? That's your job. Market. That's it. Yep. And that's. It's called, the, it's got like a straightforward name, right? Like the effect of, of the obesity on, on wages. Of obesity on wages. Okay. Yeah. So where are you, what's the data again in that? So it's the NLSY, uh, the NLSY merged with the children of the NLSY. Oh man, that is not used enough. Yeah, they're great. And you had Bob Michael on. To yeah, talk I had about, Bob Michael. Uh, I mean, I, I know cool it's data. used. He told me it is used a lot, but I feel like amongst the economists, I used it. I used just the NLSY 79 and 97 for my dissertation, but, but, uh, I never, I never used the child. Why'd you use the child? Why'd, why'd you learn? Because, yeah. So the identification strategy was like, you'd be worried about the endogeneity of weight. So, yeah. so there is this correlation that like for, for women, for example, heavier women do tend to earn less. Mm. It could be reverse causality, right? So it could mm. be poverty leads to, you know, weight gain, or it could be um, omitted variables of like injury, health problems, who knows mm -hmm. what. And so the identification strategy is to exploit the heritability the of parents. weight. Yeah, the parents. And so to use the children's um, weight as an instrument for uh, the mother's weight, for oh, example. Oh, no way. You're, using, you're going in the other direction. You're yeah. going, you're going, you instrument for the mother's weight with the child's weight, getting the heritability. Yep. Oh, interesting. Cause there's no reverse causality there because they're not earning any wages. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. yeah so that's the idea. Oh, 
Wow. Yeah. 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 So, so, so what do you find? Like, what, yeah. So, what we find is that um, the there is evidence that ob obesity, high BMI, lowers wages, but only for white females, not for black or Hispanic females. Does it change a lot when you did the IV from the OLS? It gets bigger, right? It, oh, this is kind of the yeah. standard. This is iron uh, law of IV, right? Yeah, that's right. The point right. of Smiths get bigger, right. but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's got to get bigger because the standard air is going to get bigger. And then the only, yeah. So, uh, um, huh. Wow. So you go on the market. So I'm sure it like, I'm sure Becker would just, well, I mean, what was his response to it? My, I have an idea, but like, what was his, what was his reaction to this kind of new research agenda that you sort of were opening up based on his research, based on that rational addiction stuff? I mean, I thought he, I think he thought it was a very natural yeah. Route to pursue, right? Like he's not shocked to find out about, you know, people right. going in a different direction with economics. Mm -hmm. That's his MO throughout his whole life. So, right, right. Well, so when does Hammermish's beauty stuff come out? Cause it's always like I've seen, I always kind of feel like you and Hammermish are like these pioneers of this, like this, this, you know, these two things that are kind of similar, but that are distinct having these labor market implications. When, when does that happen? Are you got, you're before yeah, him, right? It, no, I don't think so. So there was, um, I think his came before, um, mm. but his is really like you, like you said, more about like beauty, yeah, um, and not so much about like weight. Mm. Um, although interestingly, some some research has used things like weight, weight waist to hip ratio is like mm. a measure of attractiveness. Mm, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, right, 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 right. So you go on the market. And you got this job market paper. Becker Becker sees it as natural. What what do you what do you think the market? What is the market thinking? I mean, you get a great job, but like, what's the what's the reaction that you're getting? To yeah, this I think place? it's a mixed bag, right? Like, um, I remember there was one uh, there was one place I went where there was these sort of younger. I think they were RAs, just like chuckling the whole time, mm. like they just thought this was hilarious. An economist studying, um, yeah, you know, obesity and weight. And there was a time I interviewed in an interdisciplinary unit. And the non-economists, uh, I remember them just saying, like, really, like, thinking they were laying down the law and saying, like, what do you think economics has to contribute to this topic? Like, yeah, yeah, explain yeah. it to us. Right. And they kind of felt like you've you've left your lane, and we're gonna right. we're gonna push you back to your lane. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, being territorial about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the 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 the. I've had that. I've had that experience too. Yeah. Um. So I have this um, uh, quote from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. I read this this week to Hide Ichimura and I, I thought this would be kind of fun. So he, the opening line is, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredul incredulity. So I'm curious, what were the best of times and what were the worst of times at Chicago for you as a PhD student? You, you may have already said all this, but I'm just kind of curious if you, you know, to summarize what, it, what was sort of the, the best and the worst of that whole experience for you looking back. Yeah. So like I said, I think the worst was just like for personal reasons, like I was, I was very sick and I was, you know, breaking up with a fiance the first year and I, so I was at a real low point. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that had spilled over to my academics. And so combined, that was just a, a you know, sort of unfortunate time, dark time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then honestly, like the best of times became, surviving that and emerging from it and getting to work with Heckman, getting to be advised by Becker, getting to go to conferences and present work, get, yeah. get articles published, mm -hmm. um, and then end up getting a job in the profession that I wanted yeah. to be in. So, yeah. uh, uh, overcoming adversity, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So were you, so you get this job at Cornell, but it's at Pam, right? It's not in the, or you, did you have a joint appointment at econ Pam from the start? Well, so in between, I was a postdoc at Michigan. There was this amazing postdoc, the Robert Wood Johnson Scholars in Health Policy Research, which was yeah. interdisciplinary. And then it later, they later scrapped the postdoc program, unfortunately, but it was a great, so there were economists, sociologists, and political scientists all together, mm. um, you know, in this great postdoc program. And uh, Michigan was a wonderful place to be a postdoc. There's just so many others. It's a recognized mm. class. Yeah. Uh, you're not a tweener. Um, uh -huh. And so just had great advisors there. Uh, yeah. Well. So there's this other part of the Dickens quote. He says it was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. So now I'm kind of curious when you think about 
either your own career because you're the most pro, one of the most prolific writers uh, that I've I've met. Your production function is incredible. So, uh, and I would actually be curious what you could tell me about your production function. But so when you think about either your career or just like the history that you've observed, maybe in economics in general, although you're so nice, you probably won't say there was an age of foolishness, but like, do you feel like uh, there was this period of where, you know, there's been this age of wisdom of like really things that has turned out to really pan out and this stuff that just didn't pan out? I'm just hmm. curious what 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 you've sort of so, seen. So here's here's what went through my head when you're talking about like, you know, the sort of golden age of wisdom is it was super cool to be at Chicago during their incredible run of Nobel Prizes. Hmm. So like before I got there, there was 1990 Merton Miller. In 91, it's Ronald Coase. In 92, it's Becker. Yeah. And then we, sh- so they've won three in a row. And right. then me and my class show up. Uh, then Fogel wins, hmm. right? That same year. So four in a row. And mm. the funny like sort of story going around is that when the, uh, you know, the Swedish Nobel Committee calls Vogel's house at like four in the morning, his wife says, oh, he's at the office. He's not here. And so they have to call the office to get a hold of him. Right. So right. He, he may have known uh, he may have suspected the call was coming. He, and he wanted been. to be at the office for that. <laughs> so then uh, 94, that was a big dry spell. Mm. No, no, no Chicago Nobel in 94. But then in 95, Bob Lucas wins. Yeah. And so it's just like, and at the same time, like the Chicago Bulls, right, are winning like three, you know, they have these two three peats. And so yeah. there really was like stories in the Chicago Tribune of like UFC economics and the Chicago Bulls and like these dominant, uh, you know, right. Um, uh, what do they call them? Dynasties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the funny thing is with Bob Lucas winning is um, so I, w- I went into the um, the main econ uh, department area that morning that he won. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I get up there and there's television cameras and his girlfriend, his, his partner, Nancy Stokey, another professor in the department, and they're waiting at the top of the stairs. Mm. And I realized like, oh, they're waiting. They, they want to get the shot of Bob Lucas coming to work the morning he won the Nobel Prize. And they want to get a shot of him being greeted by his colleague, Nancy Stokey. Right. But mm-hmm. he's like, he's not there yet. So mm. I go, I go in, I check my mail folder. I do my business. I'm, I'm leaving. He's still not there. And as I get to the top of the stairs, here comes Bob Lucas up the stairs. The lights on the cameras snap on. They're, they're running the, the movie cameras. And like, I'm the first person who gets to say, oh, congratulations on the Nobel Prize. Like in this like footage of him coming in, <laughs> right. I, I screwed up the, uh, the, the script there. <laughs> well, uh, what, and- what do you think about things that you thought, like looking back since you've, since you've been, in, you've seen literatures, you know, uh, what surprised you that, you know, in the end, maybe didn't pan out like you thought it was going to pan out? Like not necessarily, I mean, it's like whatever that is, like a literature or, you know, papers that you thought were amazing that just never really seemed to catch fire or even things that just turned out to not be all that interesting. Yeah, so it's a great question. I mean, you know, have you ever heard this saying about Hollywood? Nobody knows anything. And what it refers to is the fact that like you can have like the best stars a great script, an incredible name director, and then people don't go to the movie and it just yeah. doesn't do any box office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's definitely true. Like there are even now like papers I think of as being great and well-known, but you go and look and like nobody's citing them, you know? Nobody's or, citing them. Yeah, right. or, you know, papers from long ago that stick in your head as being s- just really great. And you wonder how many other people remember these. I don't know, like, um, like Hayek's like the role of information yeah, in society. The use of knowledge in society. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just think of that all the time of like yeah. the reason that, for example, like a communist command and control economy won't work is they don't they don't have the information. They don't know what the I price is. Think about that be. paper all the right? time too. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a I think that paper might be getting a revival in platforms or mechanism design or something. There was a Journal of Economic Perspectives article that I saw and they were citing the heck out of it. And I was like, these aren't even the, the classical liberal libertarians. It was like uh, it was something in this more computer science area that uh, I was really surprised how it's getting new life again. But I had not heard about it. Yeah, I. I yeah, I guess another thing that your, your question makes me think of is just. Um, uh, the sort of um, boom of interest in nudges, right? So mm. the concept is great, right? It is definitely true. And I, I think an important uh, contribution of behavioral economics is how sometimes smaller things matter more than you'd think, right? Like, right. so the idea of like administrative burdens, 
like neoclassical, of course, would recognize the role of a time cost, mm -hmm. but would also say like, but wait, like if there's a huge amount of student loan money available, like people will put in the time cost to like fill out the FAFSA and they'll get the mm -hmm. money. And behavioral economic kind of shows that more than you might think otherwise, mm -hmm. that time cost can prevent people from doing it. Um, so I think there's absolutely truth to it, but I think that that there was like a viral spread of the concept of a nudge. Yeah. And it became believed that like this was a common thing that's right. that small environmental changes can lead to big differences. Yeah. And I think it's actually quite rare. And when they do happen, they often fade away. There's not a durability of effects. Like mm. how many like major studies have you seen of nudges that aren't mm. changes in prices, aren't changes in time costs, mm -hmm. aren't providing information, which are all neoclassical, mm. have been shown to like really dramatically affect outcomes. Yeah, uh, that's a really good that's that's pretty interesting i can see why you would have because you've sort of worked in a way kind of on that i mean in a way it's like putting calories up for people to see might be a nudge right i mean it's also very neoclassical just provide missing information providing missing information <clears throat> yeah. yeah right 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 okay so you know one of the things that i think you, you maybe people don't quite realize this is um you know, in, in our field, for those that are listening that aren't from econ, you know, e econ is, I think I get the sense we're relatively organized compared, our job market is relatively organized compared to other fields. I mean, I've never been in them, but like sure. when I, it does seem like we, we work really hard to get the search costs as low as possible and to do it all at a conference. But, you know, you also provided this um, public good of writing this job market guide. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about the origin of that and like what sure. it was like that first, you know, what, where did that come from? What is it? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I was back in Chicago, I was a graduate student. And at that time there kind of, there wasn't any clear guide to being on the job market. And also there wasn't the same level of investment by faculty and administration in students job market preparation mm. and so there wasn't like a placement committee that spent a lot of time with you you know gave you feedback on practice job talks or mock interviews and so i just started taking notes like i tried to read as much as i could about the econ job market i tried to talk to older cohorts and keep notes and um you know, just realize like, you know, I should just like share this with other people. Like, what's the point of me? Like just keeping this on my, you know, hard drive. Right. And then another like sort of important step was that I did a postdoc. And so I knew I would be going back on the market just two years later. And so I kept adding to it, kept working on it. Mm. And somebody who was really nice to me is uh, David Colander of Middlebury College. Yeah. Uh, so he's written these books on the making of an economist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd read his books and I, I emailed him and said, hey, I'm, I'm trying to put together this guide to the job market, I wonder if you might be willing to give me feedback. And he was really encouraging. And that's how it ended up actually getting posted to the AEA website is like, you know, their sort of unofficial uh, guide to the job market. And then uh -huh. I kept uh, revising it and then had the good fortune to get appointed to the AEA's uh, ad hoc committee on the job market, which was chaired by Al Roth. When was and, that? How many years oh, after you had written the, the thing did that, did that happen? I'd have to go and look, I'm guessing now, around 2010 yeah that's, that's right. happening we didn't have the signaling when i went on the market but so so you you had been on the you had been uh you you had had a job you had gone on the market in like 99 and then the postdoc so like oh one one exactly okay yep oh, okay so then so what's this committee so it was formed by the aea to address like market failures in the market yeah. for ourselves and had so they've been taught had you sort of noticed a market failure when you were writing this stuff, when you, you, I mean, oh, I in mean, a way, like you're the fact that you're writing it is an acknowledgement yeah, of a bit of a lack market of information. Value. Yeah. yeah. So like you, you must've been thinking that way because it's sure. like a public, it's a public good, right. Hidden curriculum stuff. Right. You're either in the, you're either in the know and you know it, or you're not in the know and you don't know, you don't know it. So what somebody told me about that guide is it's the most read and least cited paper in economics. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I'll yeah. take it. So Al um, Roth, so you get called to be on the committee. Yeah. Do you and know so what, so what, do you know what this committee is going to be about beforehand? I don't know where it's going to go, uh -huh. um, but it was just, so Al Roth, obviously Nobel prize winning economist, brilliant, wonderful guy. Wonderful Who guy. also is just 
fun to mm -hmm. hear think. Yeah. And so it was really neat to like be in the room and to like be part of that brainstorming process about like what are what are market failures in the market for ourselves that are fixable. Mm -hmm. And so one issue is just a signal. Now who's there? Who's who's in this original group? Oh you, man. Roth I feel bad. I, I'd have to go Collander? back and check. Collander no. also no okay. Okay. No. Uh, Muriel Niederle, I think. Oh. Um, Peter Coles. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And apologies to to whoever I'm uh, accidentally omitting. Okay, um, so so he so y'all are brainstorming. You're like throwing stuff on the whiteboard and stuff, and 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 so like lots of. Okay, keep going. And so then signaling becomes like you know one thing that that we settle on. And so the the the, the problem is is that it's so for the reader a, listener that's mm -hmm. not an econ. What is signaling? Yep. So this is a AEA run process where every job candidate can register for free with the AEA. And then you enter in the email addresses of two jobs that you're interested in. And you, the AEA then sends a message to those jobs, whoever's like running them, that you um, are ex sending one of your two signals to them. And you can include some text to explain mm -hmm. why you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And so this is important because you're limited to two, which is what makes them valuable. If you gave people right. infinite signals, everybody would signal every place they applied and they'd be completely meaningless. Yeah. Um, and there's other most ways- most apply for about 150 jobs. Cause the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's, yeah. on the, that's on the low end probably. I, I don't know if a lot of other fields realize how many jobs the econ, econ students send out right for. yeah and actually one thing these have become i think uh, more important over time through the lens of dei diversity equity and inclusion because people who are not from traditional people from who are first generation phd people yeah. who don't have a big network in the profession do not have as many other informal ways of signaling they don't right. have like advisors or family members who can like put in a call to, to vouch for them it had been happening like informal signaling was happening oh, yeah, in an sure. uneven, in an in, in inequitable way. Right. And you can signal uh, in your cover letter, but yeah. it's the problem is cheap talk. Cheap everybody talk. can claim to be super, super interested, interested with everything. That place. Right. And yeah. so by giving everybody two, it's equitable. By being limited to two, they're meaningful. And um, so that was the first of the, the job market innovations. And then evidence indicated that it actually did increase the probability of people's um, I think that, I mean, it seemed like, what was the reaction that you remember economists had the, the profession having to y'all rolling out the signal? Cause it's like a, you know, the AEA has been around a hundred something years. So like, it's like a major historical innovation to our, our tribes labor market. What was the I reaction? Think, so I think a mix. So I think job candidates were worried that because it was new, departments wouldn't wouldn't even know to to look for the signals or to know how to interpret them and yeah. i think at the very beginning there's some there's something to that um some people were emphatic that no one would care why would anyone look um but i th hmm. think really time has shown that this is a this is a useful option to have so what happens you end up uh, like subsequently a few years later you guys get data on the placements so, or what also asked people if you had had a third signal where would you have signaled? And if people didn't signal anybody, if you had signaled, which are the two places you would have signaled? And so then you can kind of compare, for example, for the people who did signal, how did they do on the two they sent versus the third they would have sent, but didn't. Oh, and weird. that can give you a sense of whether the signals actually seem to be making a difference. So what and do you it looks find? like they do. Yeah. When so when you say make a difference, what does that mean? Raising the probability of an initial interview with that institution, with that job. Mm. What about the extensive margin? Is it helping like for the lower ranked schools? Like, is it, where does it appear to be like, where, where does it appear to matter the most and which group? So anecdotally, it like liberal arts colleges say that they really value these convincing signals because mm. they don't want people who definitely want to go to R ones pretending to be interested in liberal arts colleges and taking up their spaces. They don't have uh, the resources to fly out a lot of people. Right. And, yeah. Or just have to, if they, if they shoot for the wrong people and miss, they may lose the people who were a good match because they get snapped up elsewhere. Like the yeah. time, the opportunity cost uh, is meaningful too. Institutions yeah. outside the US, mm -hmm. you know, they also may really want to know who's seriously interested and doesn't just want to try and get a free flight to Australia, right? Mm. Um, mm. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. So uh, this is an odd, oddly worded question, but so 
I, being an econ, I wrote, I wrote this, uh, being an economist is both beautiful and hard and, and, but it's also confounded by being a human, which is also beautiful and hard. And, uh, it's just always beautiful and hard in very specific ways to different people in different ways at different times in their life. So I was curious, what have you found to be the most beautiful part of being an economist? And what have you found to be the most hard part? of being an economist? So I would say the most beautiful part is um, the parenting aspect of it. And mm. so I know you as a parent, you know, can empathize with this, that like taking the time to help people understand and appreciate the field and to get better at what they wanted, to get better at what they want to be and to help them realize their life's dreams. Like you really, I mean, this sounds kind of maybe overblown what I'm saying, but it really is true that like you can help people yeah. you know, go to the grad school they want to go to. You can help them get the job they want to get by investing in them, spending time with them, writing oh. them the right kind of letter. And the attachment that you get, the parental feeling of happiness at seeing someone else succeed. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. That shouldn't be underestimated. It's really right. a wonderful thing to see your students go on to do great things. And yeah, I've been yeah. very blessed to have wonderful students and yeah. the joy of working with co-authors, like people mm -hmm. who are your friends, as well as somebody you get to make something neat with yeah. um, in a way that's kind of co-parenting, right? Like you mm -hmm. both get to nurture this paper along and see it leave the nest and yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, so I those mean, nobody me can really appreciate what, a, you know, given the long publication lags that Econ has, nobody can really appreciate the, 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 what you have went through on that paper, except for that co-author. Right. I mean, and they and the don't level... really realize the ups and downs and the journeys and the discoveries and the disappointments. And so they be, I mean, when they are your friends, when they become your friends, it's really like on my deathbed, I'm going to remember Manisha Shaw, you know, <laughs> right, became, right. we worked on a paper together for nine years and I just great paper. Like, oh, I just, that's a classic it, paper. It, well, it was just to share it with her was so meaningful. Right. You know, and the level fixed. of trust you have, you know, that you can count on her, you know, because yeah. you've been through that experience together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so what do you think has been the most, what do you, what do you think is the most hard part of being an economist that, you know, you, you weren't expecting? I think, um, so I, I think it's a wonderful field. I don't want to be doing anything else. I'm really happy, but so you're, but you're asking, right. You're asking mm -hmm. what's like the toughest part. I think, you just have to develop a thick skin. There's always going to be criticism at a seminar. You're going to get rejected for grants, conferences, paper submissions, um, you know, and you just have to, you just have to sort of learn to roll with that. And I think even maybe worse than that is that um, you get implanted with a second voice in your head of self-criticism yeah. because you want to be able to anticipate the criticisms you're going to get from a referee from oh, a discussant. yeah that's a really good and point. so knowing and learning how to turn off that second voice yeah so that you're not constantly being critical you know, of yourself yeah too critical of yourself it's really important to do that at the right mm -hmm. time it's yeah. also really good to be able to shut that off right and right 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 be merciful to your stuff <laughs> well, so what are you most excited about that you're working on right now what, what do you what do you you know look going forward i mean or even just going forward, looking forward at either projects you're working on or just new changes in your career. What, what's give, what's making you the most excited right now? Yeah, so I mean, I guess, you know, since we're talking, I'll talk about like, I'm really excited to be working with you on this uh, this new yeah. paper that's using synthetic control. So should I give a little synopsis? Yeah, of it? Give a little synopsis. Yeah. Okay, so, so I'm really interested in, um, of course, like I said, risky health behaviors, including diet, physical activity, and obesity. And so in particular, like how do people respond to information? So how did people respond when Starbucks voluntarily posted calorie counts or when restaurants by law are required to pass post calorie counts on their menus? But a whole different kind of information shock uh, occurred at one point when um, Jared Fogel, who was the spokesperson for Subway, and this wasn't somebody who was like an actor or a singer, he was only famous because he was associated with Subway, um, had this horrific scandal where he was arrested for child porn and having sex with underage girls mm. and very quickly pled guilty. So it's a very concentrated information, release of information, like nobody knew before the raid, everybody knew with certainty very shortly thereafter. So it's kind of rare in terms of like an information disclosure. Yeah. And what we're looking at is did that end up affecting the probability that people pay 
patronized star uh, sorry subway like right. so did it and so why would you think it would well al roth has written about repugnance mm -hmm. and how repugnance can affect markets and can affect what people do and so mm -hmm. it's not crazy to think that a that the typical consumer knowing what jared fogel did associating jared fogel with subway would feel repugnance when they saw a subway sign and maybe would less be less likely to go especially so, since it seemed like fogel at least in it, at least like being a consumer you got the sense that Fogel was pretty valuable to them. I mean, I don't Absolutely. know exactly what they're, if they quantify the return on, you know, paying him, but it, I de the amount of commercials I saw of him was all right. the time. Right. And in the advertising uh, sort of About, world, this yeah. was held up as like a very successful advertising campaign. Right. And yeah, so it's kind of funny this, too. It wraps into the work you, you know. Actually, I hadn't thought about this right now, but it wraps into the work you, you've done on obesity because that was like yeah. the whole thing was just how he loses all this weight right. just eating sandwiches. Yeah, I, I, I wish that was true in my life, but that is, <laughs> that is not. I can't eat bread at all to lose weight. So, uh, yeah, so that is fun. I am enjoying uh, you and me getting to work together uh we almost and with, worked and with together julia so, so julia, julia is our star so, uh collaborator amazing. yeah who's off to great things in pure phd program so yeah 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 we all you and i, I don't know if you remember you and i almost worked together on a project on obesity and sex work do you remember that no that was fun yeah 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 i don't remember that was probably one of the uh, i'm really good at just basically uh uh, starting things and not finishing them. You're not like <laughs> that. You're not like that. You seem like- Wait, wait, wait. I have to stop you there. I have to stop you. You have completed this like magnum opus that is now like a standard for every uh, graduate student and early career researcher on econometrics. You cannot claim well, that you can't finish things. I, I got lucky, I guess. But I mean, you, you have this production function that I am just really astonished by the- the, the uh, your ability to write so many really high quality papers i'm just curious like you know if you could just kind of like there's this i don't have it right in front of me there's this like uh nobel prize winner i think in physics who ran the bell lab his name was i think it was william stokey and he he kind of just he was interested in the uh like the the far right i mean i think these guys that are like right tail scientists of sites and stuff they they seem to kind of get kind of interested in like what the heck has makes that production you know being able to just get so many grants and so many papers that are cited and so forth and um you're kind of like that you you have a tremendous body of work that you've produced and he kind of goes through and he's like there's this really interesting part of it he kind of writes out a production function and he doesn't call it that but he's like he call he writes out a production function and it's interesting that it is not Cobb Douglas it's it's a multiplicative well i guess it is no no it is Cobb Douglas uh because it's multiplicative so it's like he's got paper volume being like or sites being like the product of like eight inputs and they're the product not not addition and they would help you like, if you came up zero on anything, right? Exactly. If you come up zero, if you're good at seven, but not all eight, you will not produce things. And it was things like having a good idea, you know, knowing where to get the data, being, you know, being able to write, being able to stop writing. It was like being able mm. to like handle the, the criticism of mm. the refereeing and stuff. And it was like, mm. you know, if you're not, and his whole thing was like, he was really interested in the, like the distribution of the sites. So he's like, if you just do, you know, if you increase all of them by like 10%, then it's like a big shift in the distribution. It was all kind of abstract, but like, I'm just curious, like if you had to just kind of explain to me, and I know it's kind of hard to know, like, well, I don't really know what my, you know, I don't really know what my production function is because I don't know counterfactuals or whatever, but like, what do you think is able what do you think are the eight, the five or six inputs that you have that's like, because you're firing on all of them, you're finishing papers and, and doing well on them. What do, you, what do you think versus somebody else that, that you could think of, you don't have to name them, but that you could think of where it's like, they're good at six, but that one seven is a zero. And that's the thing. Like, what do you, what do you, how would you explain that to like a young person? Well, I guess I could, first of all, like sort of have to just with the premise, like, I think I do have to clarify, like, by a lot of standards of top econ departments, I'm not 
successful, right? Like I'm not regularly publishing top five journal articles. Mm -hmm. Um, By the standards of like a top medical school, I'm not successful because I'm not getting big NIH grants, right? Right. So I don't, I don't, you know, I just want to clarify, right? Like, yeah, uh, but I see you as, as I I definitely, I I know what you're saying, but I think that you're producing a lot of classic work. And so, and, and, and like consistently placing at a level that I find really, really impressive. But go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I value your opinion. And I guess, um, you know, what people do is a reflection of what they value, right? And so what what I've always valued is like in this job that I get to work on topics I'm interested in. And that's, that is super important for me. I don't work on stuff that I think is boring or would just, Mm. I don't do things because there's a call for grant applications. And so I just want money. And so I apply to do that. Like, I don't care. Like, I just want to work on things I think are interesting. And I want to work with people who are, good and will make the work better and that I like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's really fun to do those things. And so it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't always end up in a top five publication, but I'm really proud of the work uh, that I have done and I've yeah. really enjoyed it. Because um, like you're able to get out of bed in the morning to write papers on stuff you care about. Yep. But like yeah. you can't get out of bed to go write on something. It might be important, but you're not gonna be able to get out of bed to go work on it because you're not like, because you're driven by your own passion is that is that summarizing yeah. what you're saying yeah i think so and, yeah. and i do i look i really enjoy um the writing process but i should clarify like i, I like this saying that it's not writing that's hard it's thinking that's hard and mm. like once you really think hard about what is our research question what's the contribution of this paper what is the identification strategy like what are the methods we're actually using why does it all matter what are the implications like once you do that thinking the writing is is easy the, the writing is moving your fingers right right right, right. um right. and so it's like sort of thinking about those things and then explaining them clearly is mm. i think a very fun gratifying process mm. Mm. and i guess you don't you've got the thick skin. So you handle the referee stuff. I mean, you were saying Heckman kind of like taught you a lot of stuff. You, you sort of feel like, you know, how to, you know, how to navigate that, that like refereeing process of just like, maybe it was brutal or whatever. They're like very critical. You're just able to kind of get the paper back out there or whatever. Uh, it's not always an easy or quick process. Like I definitely, like when I first get referee reports, I often just skim them and then don't think about them deeply and put them away for a couple of days because yeah. I know I'm not going to be able to like, uh, I... be as rational as I will be later. And yeah. so just let, let, you know, get, get pissed off or whatever, and then come back in two days. And then it's like, okay, let's just yeah. like, I know. and That's a lot of the time market, I wish I could find the market. <laughs> For someone who will just read my referee reports and then like, mm. you know, I'll, and then they just tell me and they say it in a nice way and I don't, and then I can like not lose my mind. Yeah. <laughs> but and it's not- the funny thing is, is that once you give yourself time to calm down and you really yeah. read things carefully, things actually turn out to be a lot more reasonable and, yeah. and fixable than you originally thought, right? There's yeah. this kind of, and it's, it's like, goes back to the sort of what we know about the biology of the brain, right? That there's sort of mm. the rational prefrontal cortex, there's an emotional limbic system right. and the limbic system is more powerful and quicker. Yeah. And so it will override your rational brain at first and make mm-hmm. you upset or frustrated or annoyed. But like, yeah, with time and you calm down, then you can apply the, your rational uh, skills to solving the problem. Right, right, right. Awesome. Well. Uh, you know, this is, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, this is, I guess. Okay. So I have one more thing. So I once asked Susan Athey, I said, well, what's your favorite paper? And she said, well, that's too hard of a question. I tell my kids, you're not supposed to think, ask questions in superlatives. You're supposed to say, what's the paper you like? So I'm going to change it. Uh, what's a paper or a book in economics that you just every now and then have noticed, even after all these years, you just think about it. Not necessarily your favorite, but it's just a paper that kind of lives, as they say on TikTok, lives rent free in your mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I've already mentioned Becker and Murphy's theory of rational addiction. That's a wonderful paper uh, with lots of directions one could go in from it. Yeah. Um, and I've already mentioned the, uh, you know, use of yeah. knowledge in society. Yeah. That's the, come back to that all the time. Yep. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Um, so maybe you already said them. Is there another one? Yeah, I'm sure there is, but it's like uh, just hard to pick a single one. Yeah. So maybe the That's best true. thing to do is punch I, I, rather than just did, like give you a lot of dead air here. That's right. 
Well, John, it's so nice to, to spend time with you. I always love when we get to talk and when we see each other, it's just a real pleasure. I've always appreciated your, uh, your kindness and encouragement to me in the, in, in my career. It's uh, I've always just, you, you, you're just a very disarming, very authentic person. And so I really appreciate us getting to spend. I've always, I really love when we spend time together. So thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you. I've been, it's incredibly kind of you to invite me to, to be part of this. Thank yeah. you. Gotta see us through. Honey, you need me. Baby, I need you.